go into the black and white era. Now, when I say black and white era, I'm talking about the era that was famous by the name G V Black. Just a play of words, black and white. Okay, uh, G V Black friends, we all read about uh, him in our uh, in our second year. All right, this was third event. Remember those years, and uh, he was famous for giving us the classification for cavity preparation for amalgam restorations and, and a very key word that uh, he extensively spoke about and, and something that was believed across the globe was extension for prevention, right? Decades later, French, the entire presentation today speaks against what we have been taught. I am going to be speaking about prevention of extension. So from extension for prevention to prevention of extension, what has happened? What has changed? Let me start off by taking all of you all a few years back, right? Department of Conservative Dentistry, right? Imagine you're sitting there in, in, in that department as an intern and, and here comes in a patient and, and you've done the OPD for this patient and you have diagnosed that this patient has class one caries. That's simple. Right, patient comes in with class one carry. So what have we been taught? We have been taught that we have to now do an amalgam restoration. Now let us recognize that amalgam restoration requires removal of good tooth structure. I'm not sure how is that conservative dentistry. Good tooth structure is removed because amalgam does not bond to tooth. We need mechanical undercuts to retain amalgam in position. Also a feature that is associated with amal amalgam friends is uh, it's a word called creep. Remember reading uh, the GPT? It is to do with expansion of amalgam that happens over time. Now, as amalgam swells in the oral cavity, what does it do? It creates excessive pressure on the cusps that are surrounding the amalgam. Now, because I've already done so much tooth reduction, this cusp, all right, can over a period of time develop a crack line, right? And it's it's not uncommon, especially for lingual cusps around amalgam restorations to just fracture off. All right. Now, what happens in this scenario? In this scenario, there's not enough tooth structure remaining for us to do an, another amalgam restoration. All right. So what do we do? We land up doing a crown for this patient. For many a years, everything is absolutely fine. No problem whatsoever. And then one fine day. One fine day, this patient develops pain underneath this crown. What do you now do? You land up doing root canal treatment, right? Why? Because there's pain, there is irreversible pulpitis. You land up treating the pulp. Because so much of the tooth structure is already gone, you may now have to place a post in that tooth. Once you place a post again for a few years, everything is hunky-dory. The patient is functioning absolutely fine. Then one day comes one when the patient gets a little bit of pain. And that unfortunate day, either the root fractures or worst case scenario, the entire abutment fractures and the patient comes to you with a crown in hand. Isn't it an unfortunate situation? And yet, something that we also commonly see in our practices, the only answer left now is, I am so sorry. We will have to now go ahead and extract this tooth. And eventually, if you want another tooth in replacement, you may have to look at placing an implant there. This, my friends, is called the cycle of death or the circle of death. It all started with one carious lesion. There's a very famous saying, drill the tooth, fill the tooth, kill the tooth. Can we change something in this approach? Remember, friends, when we are doing amalgam restorations, we had to prepare undercuts, all right? But if I'm doing composite restorations, I no longer have to do the dovetails. I don't have to do uh, the, the inverted cone preparations. I can be more conservative. Why? Because dentistry today has introduced the concept of bonding. Where there is bonding, you have conservation of tooth material. Now, remember reading all our prosthetic textbooks for crown and bridge dentistry, and it said if you needed a full crown, you had to prepare the tooth following all the retention and resistance protocols. 
don't, don't we remember reading this for our long long questions for our essays even for our vivas right retention and resistance form now today the entire presentation friends is focused around partial bonded restorations p b rs now when it comes to pbrs i no longer have to worry about taper i don't have to worry about axial crown height why because once again friends i have bonding the moment bonding steps in your tooth preparation protocols change be it composite or be it partial bonded restorations okay so what are these partial bonded restorations now friends we have been doing partial bonded restorations for many a years in the form of porcelain laminates and veneers and as dr rajiv verma very beautifully says these are the longest lasting restorations in the mouth why because you preserve a whole lot of original tooth structure and you are bonding to enamel ever thought अगर हम आगे के दांत पे कर सकते हैं तो यही चीज पीछे के दांत पे क्यों नहीं कर सकते ना इफ आई वर टू डू पार्शियल बॉन्डेड रेस्टोरेशन फॉर पोस्टीरियर टीथ दीज फ्रेंड्स आर नथिंग बट योर टेबल टॉप रेस्टोरेशन ओके सो लेट्स लेट्स क्विकली लुक एट दिस क्लिनिकल एग्जांपल हियर राइट दिस इज अ केस दैट आई विल बी डिस्क्राइबिंग फर्दर एज एज वी मूव थ्रू द प्रेजेंटेशन बट लुक हियर इफ आई वर टू सी दीज टू इमेजेस समथिंग दैट द लेबोरेटरी हैज सेंट मी दिस इज द कैट डिजाइनिंग दैट दे डू uh from the occlusal view per se all right these look like full coverage restorations it just looks like they are covering the entire occlusal surface and the entire tooth so aise lagta hai ki wo full crown hai right and and this is how the laboratory actually then converts everything into ceramic this is lithium disilicate it is e max all right however when i look at these preparations from the proximal view have a look here recognize the fact that these are no longer full coverage but they are partial coverage in nature this is how it looks once it is converted into ceramic right an enlarged view across the globe friends these are very commonly referred to as occlusal veneers or crown lays okay now i personally really like this term crown lay why crown lay because it's neither a full crown nor is it an on lay right because it does not cover the entire tooth structure okay see that it covers the occlusal portion a portion of the axial wall but does not go down to the margin completely which means this is far supra gingival that is why often partial bonded restorations are commonly referred to as referred to as supra gingival dentistry this is that form of dentistry friends that does not encroach onto the marginal gingiva nor the interdental पैपिला मतलब क्या है इन्फ्लमेशन एंड फूड लॉजमेंट लेटर द पॉसिबिलिटी ऑफ फिट हैज सिग्निफिकेंटली डिक्रीज बिकॉज यू हैव नॉट इरिटेटेड द जिंजाइवा सुपर जिंजाइवल डेंटिस्टिक एडवांटेज क्या है यू कंजर्व टूथ स्ट्रक्चर इट इज इजी टू प्रिपेयर इट इज इजी टू मेक इंप्रेशन टेक्निशियन को मार्जिन क्लियरली दिखता है प्रोस्थिस बॉन्डिंग करते वक्त बहुत आसान रहता है पेशेंट ब्रश करके मेंटेन कर सकता है व्हेन द पेशेंट कम्स फॉर अ रिकॉल आई कैन इजीली विजुअलाइज वेदर माय मार्जिंस आर करेक्ट और नॉट सो देयर आर सो मेनी एडवांटेजेस ऑफ डूइंग सुपर जिंजाइवल डेंटिस्ट्री ओके सो व्हेन वी थिंक कंजर्वेशन वी टॉक अबाउट डेंटिस्ट्री दैट इज जिंजाइवा free all right that's that's where my entire presentation for today is based but remember when you're talking about gingiva free dentistry you're not talking about conventional full coverage preparations okay uh because these are not conventional preparations you need different kinds of burrs or different armamentarium to help achieve the new preparation concepts in in the first uh, episode of this webinar friends i spoke to you about the advanced burr kit that i have designed now the beauty about this burr kit is it is it's not just designed for crown and bridge dentistry but also for partial bonded so if you've heard my webinar from the last time and gone ahead and picked up this kit feel free to understand that the rest of the preparation protocols you will be able to achieve with this kit but if you want an exclusive kit that allows you to do uh, partial bonded preparations i have gone ahead and designed such a kit as well and this is available on a special discounted price on mikdental.in through this webinar friends i will be sharing with you a video where i will show you which birds to use and how to go ahead and prepare this on a typhodont
all right but that is as we move forward as of now uh, i'm going to share with you in pictures what are these new design protocols okay uh, there are two designs basically the first design as you see on screen friends this is called as the classic design because it's mein hum margin dete hain all right so look here these arrows tell you that there is a 360 degree margin what margin is this it's a deep chamfer margin like what we did for the anterior case remember metal free restorations uh you only and only give deep chamfer and because i'm going to be using emacs for these type of tabletop restorations i do not change my burrs too frequently i will stick to my dc burrs that is the deep chamfer burrs right and go ahead and do a 360 degree preparation for deep chamfer okay now how much reduction do i do on the occlusal surface functional cusps typically 1 to 1.5 of a point millimeter right and that also includes the functional cusp well be well as as you see here with the yellow arrow okay how about the non functional cusp remember non functional cusp does not require as much reduction so you can be more conservative so typically around 1 millimeter so remember functional cusp you go between 1 to 1.5 because that's the amount of thickness uh, emax needs to make sure it can withstand the occlusal masticatory load without fracturing lingual or non functional cusps you can easily do only 1 mm reduction now how do you gauge the amount of reduction again the answer friends is prep gauge like i discussed with you in detail in webinar 1 yellow prep gauge is 1 mm so you use it for the non functional cusp the blue is 1.5 use it for the functional cusp uh the mik dental team tells me that after having attended the first webinar a large portion of the audience has gone ahead and purchased the prep gauge i'm so happy uh to hear that from the company friends because it seems like what i'm doing and what i'm sharing with you is having an impact and and more importantly it's bringing about a positive change in your practice and approach towards occlusal preparations all right so thank you for that okay so very quickly let me show you a case that demonstrates this aspect of tooth preparation all right uh, here is a patient who comes in with uh, a large amount of occlusal breakdown as you can clearly see posterior teeth have a lot of cracks fractures they've even lost uh, a lot of enamel okay so what are my treatment options here one option is uh, i i do a full coverage restoration full crowns or the second is what you see on screen right now try to look closely and trace where the margins of the preparations are let me just zoom in to make things easier for you it's taking time and effort to recognize where the margin is right because the margin is conservative it is not equi gingival it is supra gingival it is a deep chamfer 0.5 mm in width 360 degrees of the tooth structure what is the advantage here the advantage here is when i send it to the laboratory the laboratory gives me occlusal domes occlusal veneers that i can easily go ahead and bond and and believe me use those margins are barely visible as you can see on screen i've i've zoomed in a picture right those margins where ceramic meets enamel is barely visible so it is an aesthetic replacement and at the same time it is extremely conserver with if friend these are pictures that have been shared from or or taken from uh, the master volume uh, which is the book that i have authored i will be sharing a little about that as we uh, move forward uh, this is a case where myself and dr irfan uh, kachwala uh, i have scripted the chapter uh, together all right so uh, bonded the canines to bring about the canine guidance and covered the dentin at the back in the most a uh, conservative manner possible to restore this patient's form function and aesthetics so this is all about the 360 degree preparation right more and more and more friends as time moves by i am tending towards this design that you see on screen which is the tabletop design right uh, as you can see there is no 360 degree margin preparation so there is no deep shaft right so there is no axial extension right at the same time uh, you can see that there is proximal contacts that have been opened now that's something that we decide on a clinical basis uh, and i will help you understand this as we see uh, more and more cases but uh, this is a situation where only occlusal reduction has been done right there is no preparation proximally how much reduction the exact same thing 
right? You have your functional cusp bevel and your functional cusp is about 1.5 millimeters. The non-functional cusp is one millimeter. Uh, here again, you use your prep gauges uh, so that you know you've redu reduced enough and at the same time you haven't over reduced, right? So conservation uh, is the key here. We're talking about MID, minimally invasive dentistry, which believe me, you, according to me, is the future of dentistry across the globe, regardless of where you practice, you will at some point want to come on to the minimally invasive dentistry bandwagon. Okay, let me quickly show you a case uh, for, for this design protocol. And, and this is something that I was referring to as we started this webinar. Amalgam restorations, classically lingual cusp fracturing. Again, what are your treatment options? One option is to do a full coverage restoration. Right. Some other dentists may actually go ahead and say uh, root canal karke crown dena padega. My friends, root canals are not needed. Right. Root canals should only and only be done for patients who have a bacterial problem. Right. Which means there is pulpal inflammation. Okay. These cases don't need endo. As a matter of fact, they don't even need full coverage restorations. Right. Because this is the final preparation. Remember. Retention and resistance form is for full coverage restorations. When you have bonding, you do not need traditional preparation protocols. Even a flat occlusal preparation like this is enough for your technician to fabricate prosthesis that can be bonded as occlusal veneers or crown lays and survive the test of time. Seems fascinating, doesn't it? It is. It is. I still remember the first time when, when I started doing these kind of restorations uh, and I sent these to uh, laboratories, recognized dental laboratories. Guess what? These laboratories called back and saying, sorry, sir, we cannot do this case in Emacs. It will fracture. And I'm sure you will also face this situation where <laughs> laboratory technicians who are not apt enough or trained enough or intelligent enough to understand conservation will tell you sir full cutting karke do na hum aapko zirconia bana ke dete hai nahi karna hai let's try to be conservative imagine if this was your own tooth if you came to me for a prosthesis what would you want would you want me to do a root canal and a full crown or would you want me to give your tooth a second chance at life do a partial bonded restoration. You know why? Worst case scenario, something happens. You always have the choice of going to a full coverage. If you start with full coverage, you may land up creating a bigger problem for the patient. You know why? Because the concept of a crown, it per se to me never made sense. As a student, as a clinician, more and more and more with time as I started cutting tooth, I realized I am taking good tooth material away from the patient and I would cringe in pain. My personal belief always, friends, is the worst place for enamel to be is down the suction drain. It belongs to the patient. Leave it there. It's, it's the hardest structure available to the human body. Who are we to simply cut that away? Now, friends, what is the concept of a, of a crown following endo? Uh, we've done an access opening, right? Which means we've weakened the tooth structure. Okay. Uh, now we do a composite core and then we cut tooth material away, which is enamel. Now the only structure that remains is a, is a thin peripheral ring of dentin. How often have you prepared a tooth and told yourself, I don't know how long is this going to survive? Haven't you come to a situation where you're scared this patient will come back because you know that abutment will fracture because there's hardly any good tooth material away available. These are situations, friends, that you start thinking conservative dentistry. Prevention of extension. Remember, tooth is not Wolverine. It is not going to self regenerate itself. So to begin with, preserve tooth enamel as much as possible. All right, so let me just jump in and, and ask the backend team to relay the video that we have pre-recorded where I show you both these types of preparations 
on a typodont. And at the same time, I show you uh, how to make sure that when you're preparing such teeth, you do not hurt the adjacent tooth, which is often a concern, especially if you're working on a six or a seven, especially uh, if this patient has a slightly decreased mouth opening. So request the team to please relay the video at this point. Thank you. If I need to do an overlay preparation, right, or, or say an occlusal veneer for a mandibular tooth, the first thing that I will do is I use the OR 1.2 burr, right? This is a burr from the advanced burr kit, which is used for occlusal reduction. What do I do? I first go ahead and sink the burr in following the cuspal anatomy of the original tooth structure. And I sink the burr on the functional cusp the entire depth, which automatically gives me the desired 1.2 millimeter of occlusal reduction. I do the exact same thing on the other functional cusp as well. And I get the desired reduction. I now move face onto the lingual where I sink the burr slightly less, less than full depth because I do not need the entire 1.2 millimeter reduction, I can easily get away with even a 1 millimeter reduction on the non-functional cusp. Alright, so I have these grooves which are my guides for the amount of occlusal reduction that is needed. Now when I am doing occlusal preparation, again the same concern that we have for our all teeth what about adjacent teeth, right? You don't want to create any trauma on that surface. So one option is to go ahead and take a regular mylar strip that, that we get, go ahead and place it on the adjacent region and, and lock this out, right? But what I prefer to use in my practice on a routine basis are these wedges that are available with a metal matrix present on it. These are called fender wedges. And I go ahead and, and I engage one towards the distal so this protects the adjacent tooth and at the same time it does not allow this metal matrix to kind of fly away. So I put one on either side to protect the adjacent teeth. Now I can easily go ahead and accomplish the task of occlusal reduction which is with the help of the same 1.2 bar and I make sure that I follow the original occlusal anatomy when I am preparing these teeth. So the fender wedges protect the adjacent tooth but at the same time it makes sure that I am not worried with the direction in which my burr is moving. So I, I prefer to do one cusp at a time right following the original inclination of the tooth structure. However, there are clinicians who, who prefer to do these in, in different uh, sequences and remember the sequence per se does not matter as long as you are able to achieve the desired end result, right? So here as you can see, I am almost through. I am not uh, fearful of the adjacent tooth because that fender wedge is, is protecting it from the diamonds that are present on my bird. But when I do this, I, I have the desired amount of buccal reduction, but more importantly, it's following the predetermined anatomy of the tooth, which means there is an original cuspal architecture that is retained. I now move focus to the linguals where, where again I have created a groove pattern. I follow the exact same procedure, right? One cusp at a time, go ahead and reduce it the desired amount. Once again, the fender wedge is protecting the adjacent tooth. This becomes a very big advantage in cases where I don't want to open the proximal contacts at all, right? which, which is a part of one of the designs that, that I showed you guys uh, earlier during the webinar. Right? I go ahead and I make sure that everything is, is merged beautifully along the midline. Everything has to be smooth and free flowing. Right? And, and then all we need to do is create a functional cusp bevel, right? So what we do is we orient this burr at an angle, 
right follow the plane 2 of the adjacent tooth and just make sure that I orient the burr along the same angle because remember on a functional cusp uh, you need a, a slightly greater thickness to make sure that your porcelain does not fracture under function all right so that's that's all that is needed if you want to do the the tabletop version of your preparation design let me just clean everything up and show pictures to you of the same all right this is how it looks when i remove the fender wedges and i just dry the surface looking at it from the buckle as, as you can see there is a functional cusp bevel there is adequate amount of occlusal reduction it's just a butt preparation at this point of time lingually we don't do uh, any further reduction because it's a non-functional uh, cusp but remember to continue to follow the, the occlusal anatomy when you do so now if this is the preparation design that you desire all you need to do is just run your finishing diamond uh, I, what I prefer to use is my DC 1.2F which is again from the advanced burr kit that was explained in the previous webinar and that's it. However, if I want to do uh, the other design which involves a deep chamfer margin, what I would now do is just go ahead and, and replace my uh, fender wedges. Alright, take the DC 1.2F burr, alright, that you can see here on screen and then physically go ahead and prepare a margin just like how I would do for any other prosthesis but here I don't keep the margin very low or, or uh, sub gingival or equi gingival I keep the margin far supra gingival all right so I'm going to go ahead and place my my depth grooves here here again the depth groove is only half depth of the tooth and remember because these are conservative preparations I'm doing the entire preparation with a red ring burr so I don't land up over reducing any portion of the tooth structure right one groove and then go ahead and extend it towards the uh, mesoproximal remember my goal at this point is to merely create uh, a, pro a, a margin right that's that's if I want to uh, do so however in doing so remember you're you're still a little more aggressive than the previous design because in the previous design you're not reducing uh, any any axial wall for for these margins at all all right so now that I've created a slight buckle margin here I, I do a similar uh, margin on the lingual as well uh, here again just a little make sure you are far supra gingival just create a delicate margin there the margin also need not be very thick uh, just about a 0.5 millimeter margin is all we need uh, for for these kind of conservative uh, occlusal veneer restorations I now go ahead and extend this into the interproximal as well all right because the fender wedge is there friends the fender wedge will protect the adjacent tooth it will make sure that I don't nick that surface uh, at all all right so I simply go ahead and extend the burr interproximally and I keep getting a, a fine margin in that region all right let me reorient the angle so that you guys can see better okay so as you can see I'm going into proximally and I'm uh, and in doing so I'm just attempting to create uh, a small proximal uh, platform so that my prosthesis can go and rest uh, in there so I get a definite path of placement basically that's the advantage of this technique as you can see I've created a proximal band there I do the exact same thing on uh, the distal margin right these are very very simple and very quick in, in terms of preparation because you don't have to do a, a lot of reduction as compared to what we have to do for uh, regular full coverage restorations where there is an excessive amount of preparation that is needed now you need to be a little more patient if you're using the red ring burrs because remember these are for finishing not for preparation but uh, because I'm wanting to be more conservative that's why I'm, I'm using them so I go ahead and I round these edges off and I just basically join all the transition uh, line angles and all the preparation margins and, and in doing so I am moving closer to the actual uh, finishing of the preparation lingual margin done just buckley also I am almost through but just connecting this and smoothening it that's all I'm doing at this point of time 
smoothening this into the proximal profile. So buckle into the proximal also runs in a very smooth margin. I go ahead and I'm finishing the occlusal surface as well. Once again, maintaining the original architecture, right? You don't give up uh, on that. Maintain your functional cusp bevel. You don't give up on that either. Right, you go ahead and finish and polish the lingual margins as well. Make sure everything is, is rounded beautifully. That's one of the primary mandates of uh, all bonded restorations. Right, and, and this is where your preparation per se is complete. Let me quickly go ahead and clean up and show the same to you once again. Right, so when I dry everything and I remove the fender wedges, this is how the preparation looks. You have a uniform 360 degree deep chamfer margin, uh, buckly, interproximally, lingually as well. And you have a nice uniform occlusal preparation. This is where you need to take a call if you want to open the proximal contacts or not. As you can see, distally the proximal contact is open, but mesially the contact is still maintained. And, and this is where the beauty of the end cutting burr comes in. This is the EC burr again from the advanced burr kit because when I move into proximally like this, it's only and only going to run on the enamel of this wall and not nick or hurt the adjacent tooth at all. Right, so slowly I run through. Again, it's best to go from the lingual or from the palatal into the labial. Because as you do that, uh, the possibility of nicking the adjacent tooth significantly decreases. Now that I've run the burr across, I'm just going to dry the surface and show it to you. See, we've managed to open the proximal contact without hurting the adjacent tooth. If the surface looks a little rough, just go ahead and run your burr or you could even run a soft flex disc and that beautifully smoothens the entire preparation for you. So this is all you need to know with respect to preparation for a table top restoration for a posterior tooth. Video I hope added uh, more clarity to what you are supposed to do if you want to prepare teeth uh, for table top restorations be it the classic design or the table top uh, variant and, and remember once again uh, through all of this, I keep harping over the fact that try to be as conservative as possible, right? Uh, preserve as much tooth structure as you can. And remember, tooth preparation protocols remain the same, be it a mandibular tooth or a maxillary tooth, right? Uh, those don't change, uh, except for the fact that the functional cusp be well, mandibular is buccal, maxillary is palatal. So preparation protocols remain the same, right? Now, let me ask you a question and then of course, answer it myself. Okay. Uh, do partial bonded restorations have to cover the entire occlusal surface? Now, the two preparation protocols that I showed you were, were classic uh, crown lays, right? They covered the entire occlusal surface. But uh, through, through all these years of formal education, we do know that we have inlays and onlay type restorations also. All right. So, uh, you don't have to cover all the cusps like you see in, in this uh, small uh, uh, kind of trial uh, preparation that I have done on uh, a typhodont. Okay, so uh, let me quickly show you what are the preparation protocols if you were to do an overlay uh, or an onlay type of restoration. So remember onlay per se by definition is something that uh, covers more than one cusp but does not cover all the cusps. Okay, so which cusps do not require cuspal coverage? A cusp that is more than 1.5 millimeters in thickness, all right? Uh, you use something called as the Evanson gauge, I-W-A-N-S-O-N, -S Evanson, like what you see on, on screen. Uh, so these gauges are used to measure physically the thickness of a cusp. And if this thickness, right, as it relates to a measurement that you see at the bottom here, which is uh, from 0 to 10, uh, centimeters, it tells you whether a cusp is 1.5 millimeters in thickness or less. If it is less, please reduce that cusp in height and do a cuspal coverage. If it's more than 1.5 millimeters, feel free to go ahead and maintain the original cusp. Okay. 
looking at the same preparation from a slightly different view here you can see that there is a deep chamfer margin that i chose to give that again is case to case dependent and and, and a decision towards this is something that you will develop uh, as you start doing these kind of restorations which one do i give a margin which one do i not but also what's important to understand here is internal line angles right uh, the ones that have your axial wall and the pulpal floor uh, should all be rounded just like how you have in your amalgam preparations as well internal line angles should be rounded because you do not want stress concentrations there but your external line angles those can be sharp that's fine internal rounded external sharp so if you were to use your deep chamfer burrs, your, your red ring burrs, even your yellow ring burrs, you can easily create that rounded internal line angle. You don't have to do extra manner to get it. Automatically, as long as you're using the right burrs, uh, you should be fine. Okay, uh, looking at it from a different view again. Now, remember, these are indirect restorations. Okay, so you need to make sure that a prosthesis goes occluso cervically. Which means your preparations should, ha should have uh, a slight occlusal taper. We typically say 5 to 10 degree of taper is, is fantastic. That will make sure that you don't have any undercuts to the path of placement. Right? Again, kitna preparation karna hai depth, functional cusp hai, uh, 1 to 1.5 millimeters, non functional cusp, let it be 1 millimeter. So these are the preparation protocols that friends we follow for an only type of prosthesis. Let's quickly look at a case. Uh, here is a patient who kept coming back for uh, frequent restorations on the distal aspect of the six. Multiple composite restorations attempted multiple times kept fracturing. So what do you often land up telling this patient? You, you unfortunately land up telling this patient, sorry, filling will not work. We will have to do a cap. Worst case scenario, you'll have to do a crown. Now imagine if this patient comes to me and I tell this patient, no, 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 you don't need a cap. You only need a partial cap. Wouldn't this patient want to get it done from me? Yes, because no one likes to have the tooth cut. As simple as that. Isn't it frequent uh, occurrence for us that you prepare the tooth and then patient puts the tongue around it? Docs are kuch bachai nahi hai. There's nothing remaining. Right? So those situations do not arise, friends, when you're talking about these uh, partial bonded restorations. So what was done for this case? A distal half restoration. Whatever is weak, go ahead and reduce that. And then once bonded, right, it creates a biomimetic effect, which means you can barely recognize what is prosthetic and what is natural. It just integrates so beautifully because that margin is actually resin. It's a composite. And don't we use composites to do these brilliant, compo uh, brilliant aesthetic restorations? So if you have ceramic with a, a resin-based cement, your transition from prosthesis to tooth is that much more uh, indecisive to the eye right the eye cannot comprehend uh, where it ends and and where tooth material starts especially if you've gotten the the shade and the optical properties correct okay so so this is all about partial bonded restorations all right now uh, can pbrs be fabricated for endodontically treated teeth now every case that i showed you happened to be vital does that mean uh, this cannot or should not be done for uh, endo treated? Nothing like that. Feel free to. Partial bonded restorations can easily be done as post endodontic restorations. Right? As you can see here, this patient came into me with uh, an occluso muscle disorder. And, and the problem was a traumatic occlusion. All right? As you can clearly see that lower right 7 is not in its correct position. It's, it's tipped off axis. Okay? Uh, this this is uh, a post ortho a uh, relapse case and, and things uh, like that. Uh, so this patient came in with uh, proximal uh, caries. There was uh, uh, occult caries or hidden caries on the mesial uh, along with uh, a faulty occlusion. So we went ahead, uh, did endo. And instead of doing a full coverage preparation, I did a partial. When I say partial, only functional cusps were covered. Lingual cusps, as you can see here, Lingual cusps were preserved. These lingual cusps, when I measured with the Evanson gauge, were more than 1.5 millimeter thickness, which means I can preserve them. Right? And, and uh, so it has an occlusal veneer, right? And a proximal extension. 
okay and and this is how the prosthesis came back to me from the laboratory and uh, when it was positioned in place and uh, under rubber dam isolation once it is bonded it kind of became a part of the original tooth structure once again just mimicking itself into the underlying tooth uh, so it took care of the the caries issue uh, the post endodontic issue as well as the bite right so all these three things were together taken care of by a partial bonded restoration okay now uh, all these cases that i showed you were for molars so a question can partial bonded restorations be done for premolar teeth yes it can be right uh, look at this case again post endo right por done this patient came with distal caries so the distal caries lesion uh, has been restored uh, with some composite and and only uh, the proximal margin which is the distal proximal and a palatal margin was created the palatal cusp was reduced uh, 1.5 millimeters why because the buccal cusp was nice and thick it was intact so there was no need for us to go ahead and reduce that and and this is how the prosthesis kind of looks it is partial so it replaces lost tooth structure or compromised tooth structure without encroaching into tooth material that is good viable and retainable right and and once it is bonded it becomes a part of the original tooth structure it often even becomes impossible to trace the junction right so remember partial bonded restorations can be done for molars they can be done for premolars they can be done for vital teeth they can be done for endodontically treated teeth as well next question okay can partial bonded restorations be done for posterior three unit bridge preparations no if you thought my answer was yes no single unit restorations yes the moment you have a missing tooth and you want to bridge that you no longer can think of partial bonded you now have to do a three unit full coverage restoration right you can easily treat two individual teeth next to each other like you will see in this case okay uh, this was a patient who came in with uh, some wake pain and sensitivity related to the the five and the six right five has a large distal occlusal uh, caries six has a large amalgam restoration that is uh, obviously leaking right so what did i do i started with removing the occlusal caries went ahead and did my uh, occlusal preparations uh, why did i not just replace the amalgam with uh, with composite because when i look closely right this patient had developed cracks on the proximal margins right if proximal margins are involved which means your marginal ridges are involved you no longer should do only composite restorations you should now think in terms of uh, indirect partial bonded restorations so in this case i did the occlusal reduction i i cleared the proximal contacts as well i did the exact same thing for the five uh put whatever composite that i had to recreated the correct um, anatomy of the tooth went ahead made impressions the technician has sent me a digital model then fabricated emax by the press technology uh, i'm personally not someone who believes a lot in uh, cad cam milling uh not for emax at least i feel when it comes to the press technology uh the margin fitting is is better right than it is for the mill technology at least for emax i'm i'm not saying this for other prosthetic materials but for emax that is my belief and and that is something that is collaborated by what literature says as well right so now first thing what i do is i go ahead and and place it on the prepared teeth as you can see margin uh, between porcelain and tooth structure is visible right that's because there is no cement lute in the middle right so you can see that transition or that junction but once i bond it in remember you don't lute these luting means you use gic bonding means you use a resin material so i am using a dual cure resin cement and going ahead and bonding these in once these are bonded look at that transition you can barely recognize where porcelain ends and where underlying tooth structure begins once you have finished and polished these the beautiful part about these uh, these uh, junctions that are in resin is there will never be secondary caries as long as you do your protocols correctly the biggest advantage with with resin is it does not dissolve why do we have micro leakage in in other crowns where gic has been used because gic dissolves that is why kai bar kya hota when you remove an old crown the margin will look black 
that means there was micro leakage okay uh, if you loot or bond with resin cements all right resins do not dissolve and because they do not dissolve you will have a lute free or a dissolve free junction right this will make sure that the possibility of secondary carries stepping in also has been eliminated to a great great extent right so a lot of advantages friends that come out of doing these partial bonded restoration okay uh, this is how it looks from the occlusal view this is how it looks from the lingual view as well right i know this question has been in your minds still since the time i started showing you cases kya ye chalte hai tootte nahi hai kya patient wapas nahi aata does the patient not come back to you saying is broken and let me tell you you do it correctly the possibility of it breaking is much 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 lesser than the fractures that we see with pfms or with porcelain fused to zirconia based restorations and why is that let me explain to you the science behind why these table top restorations do not break easily so uh, this is friends all to do with architecture okay one monument one structure that we as indians are so proud about because it's a mark of beauty and it's a mark of strength is the taj mahal right now why has the taj mahal stood uh, stood tall for not just uh, decades and centuries but even generations okay it is because of the dome shaped architecture now now dome is often regarded as the strongest geometric design that is why you never see maxilla which is a, a dome shaped structure fracturing easily mandible tends to fracture in an accident maxilla which is hollow which is not porous which is porous rather it is not dense it's not heavily corticated does not fracture that's because of the architecture in the form of a dome so let me explain the dome dome concept to you this is again from my book master volume uh the dome friends actually has uh, three layers if i may call it right uh, look at the layer at the bottom which is red this is called as the uh, layer or zone in tension this is the zone where forces are all going outwards trying to break the dome what is preventing the dome from breaking it is the structures that you see marked in blue that is the top of the dome these are structures where all the forces are cohesive in nature so they are holding the dome together this is the compression portion of the dome the bottom is the tension portion of the dome and just like how earth has an equator look at this green band in the middle this is called as in flexion plane this is like the equator where the forces of compression and tension are balanced and and it kind of holds the, the entire dome in such a strong compressive force that the dome does not break amazing absolutely amazing now now why am i telling you this because i can equate this to tooth how does enamel sit on top of the weak dentin it sits like a dome all right now remember every tooth instead of an in arc uh with with a surveyor remember doing cast partial dentures okay and and we used to mark the height of contour of a tooth okay so if the height of contour of a tooth is the equator everything that lies above it is compression that's your blue everything that lies below it is tension which is red the red area friends in a tooth is called bio rim b i o r i m bio rim everything that's above is called as bio dome d o m e that's your dome all right just like how you go to see a theater in a dome all right bio dome now bio dome is all compression bio rim is all tension so imagine right imagine i have done access opening and root canal for the patient occlusal only and now i restore that with a restoration or a prosthesis that is present only and only in the compression region what have i done i have restored the entire balance of the tooth without going into the tension zone which means i have not encroached into the weaker area of the tooth remember the neck of the tooth is where bending forces occur because that's where your cj is 
it is on top where maximum strength of a tooth is present and i have recreated that strength by giving the patient an occlusal dome which is frequently called as the overlay the crown lay or the occlusal veneer that is why these kind of restorations do not allow the abutment tooth to fracture they hold the entire structure in immense amount of compression okay now what what if i'm doing this for say a, a premolar tooth a premolar tooth uh, i cannot just do an occlusal dome because the junction between the porcelain and the underlying tooth may be visible right so that is why look closely at the screen i have extended the preparation onto the buccal region which means this is a buccal veneer plus an occlusal veneer these are classically friends called as v top or veneer lay restorations okay just fancy names for the same thing all right so look look at look at this picture canine first premolar second premolar first molar if you look at it from the buccal you will think yaar ye to crowns hai they look like crowns but where are they different they are different on the palatal surface look these are flat but preparations far supra gingival which means there is no axial reduction whatsoever so what have i done i have preserved a chunk of tooth enamel on the palatal face is this an aesthetic compromise no is it a functional compromise no but it is a major tick on the biological principles of tooth preparation it is preserving original tooth material and we know no matter how strong a prosthesis we give our patient nothing can replace original tooth material and what better than preserving that for our patients another question that i know is now luring in your minds okay i understand these don't break easily but don't they come out i remember first when i started sending these to the laboratories one of my laboratory technician in a very innocent manner caught back to me he said sir i want to speak to you about something and i said sure beta give me a call let's talk and and he said sir uh, when when you do only this uh, occlusal reduction and and you don't give me full caps uh, patient kyun mai pisal nahi jata ye he is asking me do these crowns not slip off in the patient's mind why because our heads through education have been trained retention and resistance form that's unfortunate you land up doing aggressive tooth preparations do these debond depends depends on what amount of enamel available for bonding remember dentin is not a good substrate for bonding but enamel gives you predictable bond okay so have a look at these preparations whenever you prepare a tooth you will often see ke uh, at the at the periphery you see a white line that white line is your enamel right a classic table top preparation is what you see here on a maxillary first molar okay i want all of you all to uh, look closely at at what i'm trying to show you here the central portion that i've highlighted now in yellow is your dentin okay i know i'm not going to get good bond to that but what is surrounding the dentin 360 degrees around dentin is enamel and if i have enamel to bond to literature says more than 90% more than 90 90% of your bond strength comes from this peripheral ring of enamel and you are not dependent on the central core dentin this is why table top restorations do not debond very easily as a matter of fact they are what is called as monoblock and if you want to remove them you have to cut them out they will not come out but at the same time look closely at this very same preparation can you see i have given a buccal groove and i have given a palatal groove traditionally what was the thought of a groove secondary retention and resistance but here i am not worrying about retention resistance at all then why have i given that uh that buccal and palatal groove this in such a situation is purely from the perspective of anti rotation look closely proximal contacts are intact i have not broken the proximal contacts which means the occlusal dome that comes in i'm never sure in which position is it supposed to sit 
so these two groups guide me or orient me to make sure that i place the restoration in its exact same position why because if i don't position this correctly my adjacent restoration will not seat so remember groups in this situation are purely for orientation and the biggest advantage with not opening contacts is no fear of food lodgement post bonding i have not touched the proximal contacts i have not touched the interdental papilla there is no reason why this patient should now develop a proximal periodontal problem a gap should not open and food lodgement should not occur aren't these mind baffling things right now i still remember when i first heard about all these kind of restorations i was like yaar ye sab india mein possible nahi all this cannot be done in our country and the speaker then told me you cannot learn swimming by watching someone else swim you will have to dive in and this was when i was doing my mds in the year of 2010 I have spent all these years trying to do partial bonded restorations and I have come to a point where I exclusively do partial restorations in my practice unless it's a repeat crown unless it's a bridge prosthesis my restorations will be partial bonded I have become such an ardent fan such an ardent believer and someone who propagates partial bonded restorations because I would want these done if I needed one right I do not want to see my enamel being sucked away I want my enamel to be retained and I'm sure that is what you want for yourself and that is what you would want for your patients also but remember in all of this the key step is bonding and if you are using lithium disilicate you have to prepare the prosthesis for bonding and this involves armamentarium classically you need hydrofluoric acid either 10% or 4% 10% is yellow color 4% is pinkish reddish color remember if you are using 10% you will keep it in contact with the tooth only for 10 seconds when i say tooth my 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 uh, apologies that is prosthesis so i will uh, dispense the material that is the hf 10% on to the fitting surface of my emax and leave it there for 10 seconds don't be like 10 seconds mein kya hota i will leave it for 20 seconds don't do that these are thin restorations and etching will cause uh, crystals to dissolve so you don't want to land up weakening the material so much that while seating it breaks and it's happened to me that's why i'm telling you don't do it right learn from from my foolishness if if i may call it uh etch for 10 seconds it will give you a frosty white appearance when you wash it away with water right now put your 37% phosphoric acid on top of this leave it there for 30 seconds wash it away with water what will this do any crystals all right that are present on the surface 37% phosphoric acid will leach that out so you have a nice clean frosty white appearance now on top of this you put your silane coupling agent right and and leave it there for 60 seconds allow it to evaporate right 60 seconds the silane can evaporates leaving uh, a bonding material or or an emax that is so prime so ready for bonding that it will go ahead and hold on to the dual cure resin cement that you use in an extremely strong predictable manner how do you prepare the tooth in the conventional way when i say conventional way we all have been doing direct composite restorations for probably donkey's years now right uh we we etch the tooth uh we we wash it away we apply bonding agent we air dry it we light cure it and then comes the prosthesis so that aspect remains the same now what's important here again is isolation ideally these should be bonded under rubber dam isolation and you use a dual cure resin cement remember light cure resin cements are for anterior teeth uh when you are talking about thin veneers dual cure is for posteriors because these restorations are significantly thicker so any dual cure resin cement in the market right i'm not going to take trade names but that is a personal uh, choice from clinician to clinician 
right? So, uh, one aspect about these partially bonded restorations, if I may label it as a drawback, is occlusion and its understanding. Okay. Now, what do we do with PFMs or zirconia based restorations? We call for a BISC trial. We try it on. We put articulating paper, which we ask the patient to bite. We adjust and then we send it for glazing. That option is no longer available or was never available with Emacs. Why? Because Emacs is glass ceramic. If you place it there without bonding and ask the patient to bite, the glass will break. And you will be like, yeah, Dr. Mohan the bola ta acha hai. He said this is good and it's broken. Even before I fixed it. Lithium disilicate can only and only be checked for occlusion after it has been bonded to the underlying tooth structure. Remember, you go ahead and bond and then go ahead and refine the occlusion. And for refining the occlusion, this is the burr shape or the design that you're supposed to use, friends. This is the CA or the Ceramic Adjustment Burr 1.6F. It's a part of the... Uh, uh, advanced burr kit and also a part of the partial bonded restoration kit. Okay. Uh, and, and we use ideally a 40 micron, 40, 40 micron articulating paper to adjust the bite. And, and at this point, I'm going to take the liberty of sharing with you friends about webinar three. This is going to be on the 21st of April once again from 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time where I shall be addressing occlusion in fixed prosthodontics. Okay, coming, coming back. Uh, can partial bonded restorations be made only using Emacs? Nahi. Emacs is the indirect form. There is also a direct option available which is with your regular chair side composite restorations. Look at this case. This is a case of a dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Akshay Sharma. Uh, preparation done. You can clearly see that there is a sound ring of enamel that is present peripherally, post-endodontic. Okay. Uh, alginate impression made. This impression is poured with what you see here in red. All right. This is called dye silicone. It's a flexible addition silicone material that can be used to pour casts. What is the beauty here? The beauty here is I can take my chair side composite, regular composites, create the entire anatomy of the tooth myself uh, without sending it to the laboratory, which means zero laboratory cost. Zero laboratory cost. All right. Uh, I go ahead and now isolate the tooth, bond it in, check the occlusion, refine everything, finish polish. How amazing does that look? supremely biomimetic it is beautifully merging into the underlying tooth structure no one can say where it starts where it ends uh, because composites are softer in nature this will make sure it does not cause any problem to the antagonist either again do these last last yes they do studies state in excess of 80 percent survival survival over five years more than 65% survival over 10 years, which is in tandem with what PFMs and zirconium would give you. If you do this indirect in Emacs, the survival rates are even higher. So these do survive. And as you can see, they don't cost much, uh, not to us and, and therefore not to the patient as well. Often these are called as no post, no crown concepts as well. Because you're not uh, doing a post to uh, restore tooth strength, nor are you doing full or uh, com complete coverage restorations. In my opinion, this is a brilliant form of dentistry uh, and, and a very noble thing that we can do for our patients. Coming to the next aspect of this presentation, which is uh, endocrowns, right? And these are post endodontic restorations, which have a dome like extension. Okay, so let's let's quickly look at these. This is the final preparation, right? Uh, this is your core. Now, now, normally what we do after access opening is we build the entire core structure in composite. In endocrowns, you don't do that. You leave the core the way it is, okay? That's the periphery, just kind of enlarging everything for you. Uh, look at this new outline that I am drawing. This is the DEJ. So whatever's within, that's the yellow, is your dentin. Whatever is in blue is your enamel. So if you have a 360 degree ring of enamel, be very confident this will survive the test of 
time. This is how the uh, endocrown looks. It has an occlusal dome with, with a nice uh, umbrella-like extension which goes into the core. And, and once it is bonded, again, you can barely recognize where it ends and where the underlying tooth structure begins. This was a classic case where uh, proximal contacts were not opened. Right? Let me quickly show you a case of endocrown where proximal contacts had been opened. And, and the reason why I opened them is because this patient had an MOD caries lesion. So there was occlusal caries, there was proximal caries. Now when there's proximal caries, I don't have an option. I have to go into proximally and open the contacts. Right? This is how the impression looks. Look at that central core that has been impressed so beautifully. Okay, This is how it looks on the cast. You have the core and, and you have the periphery of the tooth structure. And this is how the prosthesis kind of looks. It has these proximal extensions and it has the uh, coronal dome. Uh, and, and recognize the fact that on the left, you can see I don't have to do a lot of tooth structure removal. Right? Uh, and, and still I get a prosthesis that fits beautifully and I can be extremely conservative. Right? Uh, post bonding that's how it looks look at that uh, seven when I look at it from the lingual view you can recognize that this is far supra gingival now regularly the concern especially for sevens is lingually there's not a lot of tooth height available right uh, which is why you're always concerned that if I do a full coverage restoration uh, will this keep coming out so this is an answer to uh, those clinical scenarios where the crown height is less so typically mandibular and maxillary sevens or those situations where the crown is uh, so badly broken, you don't have enough tooth material to do a full coverage. So you can think of taking the central core as your bondable material and, and go ahead and do an endocrown. Please don't do an endocrown for all your cases. Right? Always think worst case scenario. What if you have to do a retreatment for this tooth? You, it's very difficult to bore uh, access through an endocrown. Okay, uh, so do an endocrown only if your crown height is very short. Okay, one and second, if the amount of tooth material is very compromised and you don't want to do a crown lengthening uh, and, and you don't have enough tooth material available uh, to do a full coverage restoration. That and uh, only that situation should you think in terms of doing an endocrown. Okay, guess what? I am so confident today about partial bonded restorations that I don't mind using Emacs even for full mouth restorations in patients who are bruxers and who have lost vertical dimension. Yes, stop being scared. Fear is probably what is going to stop you from trying these. So don't be. Learn from what I am doing. Right? If it helps improve your work, your quality of dentistry and help uh, improve your patient experience, what more can I ask for when, when, when we discuss um, at, at lens, even during these lockdown uh, situations? Yes, we, I am based in Mumbai where we are in a 100% lockdown situation. So no work to do, but I, I wouldn't want to do anything else uh, than sit and share with you of my experience, especially with Emacs restorations. Okay, so quickly have a look at this patient, 59-year-old Mr. Sudeep, uh, an extremely jovial man. But, but does not like to smile a lot because when he smiles, he does not show a lot of tooth material. So a lot of his friends tell him he has no teeth in the mouth. So uh, he does not uh, laugh or smile much despite the fact that he's very jovial uh, and, and tends to crack a lot of, lot of jokes himself. Okay. Uh, and, and this is why you can clearly see he's lost, lost a lot of tooth material. Incisal edges are badly worn down. Uh, not just anteriors, but you can clearly see all posterior teeth. Literally every tooth in the oral cavity has lost enamel coverage. There's dentin exposure on all these teeth. Now, unfortunately, I cannot go into the depths of talking to you about full mouth rehabilitations uh, in, in this uh, webinar at least. But if you want more details, go to YouTube. I have uh, a lot of videos there where I talk about full mouth uh, rehabilitations for these kind of uh, cases. But... Uh, what I'm trying to tell you during this webinar for this particular case is even if your patient comes with so much breakdown, don't jump into thinking I will have to give this patient monolithic zirconia else the patient will break my prosthesis. Don't do that. You may land up creating a bigger problem for the patient if you do monolithic zirconia. That's my take. Right? I would love to treat this patient with bonded Emacs. 
which is what I have done for this patient. And I can be very conservative in my preparations, right? Look here, my labial preparation ends mid-labially. Forget equigingival or subgingival. I am far supragingival. For posterior teeth, as you can see, I have not opened contacts. Anterior teeth, all preparations are in the center of the tooth. Final prosthesis that comes in is supragingival in nature. I go ahead, same for the mandibular. And under rubber dam isolation, we go ahead and bond it for the patient. This is how it looks. There is, yes, a dramatic junction between tooth and porcelain. Bite looks perfect. But I know you have a question in your mind. Will the patient accept this? And my answer is, my patient loved it. My patient absolutely loved it. Why? Because I was conservative. I did not cut a lot of his original tooth structure. But at the same time, I gave him a smile that is also oh pleasing. Remember, this patient has a very low lip line. So what do I do? I increase length. I, be, I stay conservative. And yet the patient does not show underlying tooth structure. So why will my patient have a concern with where have I left my margin? And I love saying this. No patient goes out saying, see, this is what my dentist did for me. He's not going to do that. He's only going to smile as wide as he physiologically can. And I have made sure that he smiles the widest and all people can see is porcelain. Function, tick mark. Biology, tick mark. Aesthetics, tick mark. The best of all three worlds with the help of partial bonded restorations. The only area where I failed is, is look at this lower right six. You can see that occlusal dome so clearly seen. He did not care about it. He said, I, it doesn't matter to me. It looks beautiful. I now can smile and I love flaunting it. And look here, three years later, everything looks the same. Nothing is broken. Nothing is debonded. Everything is in place. We've gone ahead and restored the case with implants for the missing lower left. And stability has been achieved over a period of time. From my experience, I tell you, do not be scared of doing something different. It does work. You do it correctly, you have my assurity that things will survive. I am saying this purely from a positive experience of a decade that I have had of doing these partial bonded restorations. The calm, the peace, the happiness that we go to sleep with, I think it surpasses everything else. All I want to tell you, friends, is change how you think. Think a little different. Beautiful words by our very own Albert Einstein. If you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. And if you want to improve on all these aspects and bring about a positive change, friends, I have done my bit by scripting the master volume. 25 chapters, more than 500 pages, a complete colored atlas. 2,500 plus images, more than 200 cases that I have shared in this book. Yes, it is once again available on mikdental.in, the same place that you will get uh, the starter volume, uh, the advanced birth kit, and also the prep gauges. Very quickly sharing with you the index, uh, because I have, uh, in a very thoughtful manner, broken down topics. Remember, starter volume was all about crown and bridge dentistry. Master volume is all about catering to those things where we thought, I'm done with the, the usual dentistry. I want to do contemporary dentistry. I want to do different. I want to do more. Uh, I want to learn better things, right? That's where the master volume uh, steps in because I talk about uh, occlusion and, and occlusion with anterior teeth and posterior teeth, followed by isolation, right? Which is to do with majorly the use of rubber dams, uh, post and core. And then comes uh, the two topics of bonded dentistry, which is aesthetics, which is uh, porcelain veneers and function, which is partial bonded. So a lot of images that you saw from my presentation today have directly been taken from the book, right? Moving forward, 
in my opinion, this is the first time uh, where we have a dedicated book for full mouth rehabilitation. So this book gives you an entire section of about 250 pages, which train you about which phase and articulator to choose how to use it, uh, how to plan cases, uh, more importantly, how to record centric, how to decide the vertical dimension, uh, how to do full mouths, be it with PFM, be it with zirconium, be it with tabletops, or be it with composites, or be it with digital protocols, right? We're today moving into the world of digital dentistry, where we talk about virtual articulation. So all of those aspects have been included in here, along with sections on implant dentistry, primarily to do with implant occlusion, which I believe is a must uh, understanding for a lot of clinicians who do not want failures, uh, post implant restorations. Then you have perio ortho and ending everything is an entire section on what I believe is the future of dentistry. That is uh, the digital uh, aspects of even, even gauging occlusion with something like a T-scan. Okay, so I've put in the effort. Now it's up to you to sit back, call for this, relax. Uh, especially if you have a vacation now, right? Make the most of it. Uh, order karoge, padoge, tabhi samjega. You, you have it in your hand is when you will realize how amazing this compilation truly is I am I am hopeful this time that I've spent with you has made a difference in your perspective your thought process your approach towards uh, the next patient that you see for uh, uh, for a crown in in your uh, practice at this point friends I would like to once again thank uh, Abbott and an IDA for giving me this opportunity and for all of y'all for once again logging in such brilliant numbers and sitting through the entire webinar uh, if you want to follow me, feel free to do that. I am most active uh, on, on Instagram, uh, followed by uh, YouTube, followed by Facebook. I've even shared with you my personal contact, my email ID. Uh, if you've liked this uh, webinar, share with me. I love hearing from you. If you have questions that I'm not able to answer because of paucity in time, feel free to connect with me and I shall try my level best to give you possible justifications for the same. Uh, once again, I, I give back to Dr. Yogesh. If we have questions that we can take, I believe we have a solid uh, 30 minutes this time yes, to answer yes, all the questions. Uh, yes, Dr. Moise. Uh, certainly a very thought provoking and an interactive session, I would say. Uh, it made me think a lot of things, you know, where we used to do the